Greetings and blessings in Jesus, friends, brothers and sisters in the Lord Jesus. I trust this finds you with a hallelujah on your heart this morning. Welcome back to Be Ye Holy Ministries, where holiness is a way of life. Jesus is truly King of Kings and Lord of Lords, and the Holy Bible is our only standard and authority for truth. And together, God's people say, hallelujah. Well, friends, you know we are approaching the Thanksgiving season and millions of people are going to be celebrating and maybe saying thank you and showing gratefulness for the first time this year for the many things that they have been blessed with in this life. And although they don't know it, all good things come from the Father above. And he rains his blessing on the righteous and the unrighteous. And so there's a reason that each of us have to say thank you and show our gratefulness for the great things that God has done for us, even in the most simple things in life, things that we take for granted each and every day. And so I would encourage you not to make your Thanksgiving celebration once a year, but to make every day a Thanksgiving celebration, to begin each day and end each night simply by saying thank you for the many things the Lord our God has done for us. And if you're like me, you would start at the top and the thing that you would be most grateful for would be the sacrifice of the Lord Jesus, the life that he lived, the example that he gave unto us in redeeming us and reconciling us back into a proper relationship with the Father, our Creator. Second, of course, would be for the Word of God. You know, he could have left us absent in this world, alone in this world, to figure it out on our own. But he's given us his word through Genesis to Revelation, instruction and counsel, wisdom and guidance so that we can live each and every day as pleasing to him as we can. And of course, when Jesus left this earth, he sent back his Holy Spirit. And once we're born again and we become members in the family of God, now we have the Spirit residing within us, leading us, teaching us, and guiding us each and every day. And those, of course, are the greatest gifts that God has given to man. But aside from that, we have our family, we have our friends, we have a roof over our head, food in our bellies, clothes on our back, and many, many other things, many, many other blessings that he has given to us. And for all those things, we should be thankful. Well, with that being said, friends, we're continuing our study in the book, Love Not the World. And today we are in chapter 11, entitled, Robbing the Usurper. And this is the final chapter in this book. Now, once we finish this book, we're going to begin our study in a long-awaited study, The Spiritual Man. Now, I've encouraged you to get this book. It is a lengthy book, as you can see, and it's going to take us a considerable amount of time to work our way through it. And unlike the other book studies we've done, we're going to progress through it very slowly. We're going to deal with each chapter and each topic very carefully so that no one is left behind in understanding but it's also going to be an open discussion as we discuss the many things that our teacher, Watchman Nee, is going to both inform us and teach us as we progress through this book. And so the next time we're together, we'll begin the introduction to the spiritual man to gain a better understanding of what it means to deny the flesh and walk in the spirit. Well, without further ado, let's begin Chapter 11, Love Not the World, Robbing the Usurper. Christ Jesus came into the world to save sinners. Now we're told this in 1 Timothy 1.15 and other places of scripture as well. Since in the eternal purpose of God, it is man and not some other being who is to have dominion, it is natural and right that our compassion should be drawn out to those sinners. 
Notwithstanding anything said hitherto, we might feel that in this brief day of grace, the winning of souls to the Savior of the world is perhaps the supreme means available to us of robbing Satan of his spoils. Certainly, were man himself our theme, we should give a big place at this point to the subject of soul winning. But we have dealt with evangelism already elsewhere. If you'll remember, this was discussed in chapter 3. Instead, therefore, I propose in closing these studies of the world to take another and more materialistic area of Satan's dominion by way of practical illustrations of the art of despoiling the strong man. I refer to the field of finance. Money is opposed to God. Since Jesus says, make to yourself friends by means of the mammon of unrighteousness, he clearly cannot mean to describe it as the mammon that you have obtained through unrighteous dealings. He is therefore saying that the mammon itself is unrighteous. What is being brought before us here is not the unrighteous means by which money is procured, nor the unrighteous use to which money is put, but the unrighteous character of money. Money in its essential character is evil. Let me repeat that. Money in its essential character is evil. And when Jesus tells us, make to yourself friends by means of the mammon of unrighteousness, he is not speaking of the unrighteous means by which money is procured, nor the unrighteous use to which money is put. But he's speaking to the unrighteous character of money itself. We talk of clean money and dirty money, but in God's sight, there is only dirty money. The man who knows God knows the character of money. He knows that money in itself is evil. If you would test the character of anything, you only need to inquire whether that thing leads you to God or away from God. Money invariably leads away from God. Jesus lays down clearly in Luke 16, 13, the principle that it is impossible to serve God and mammon. Though I think that even without his statement, most of us would be convinced that this is so. For experience tells us that God and mammon are never on the same side. Mammon is always set over against God. Of course, it would be possible to interpret Jesus' words more widely and to see mammon as representing everything in general that opposes itself to God. But the Apostle Paul helps us to pinpoint money as the means the world uses most successfully to draw us away from God. For example, he says, they that desire to be rich, or those who fall into a temptation and a snare and many foolish and hurtful lusts such as drown men in destruction and perdition. For the love of money is a root of all kinds of evil, which some reaching after have been led astray from the faith and have pierced themselves through with many sorrows. You'll find this in 1 Timothy chapter 6, verses 9 and 10. In other words, if anything can lead us astray from God, money will. The essence of the world is money. Whenever you touch money, you touch the world. Now the question arises, how can we take a thing that we know assuredly to be of the world and yet not become involved with the world system? How can we handle and do business with money that most worldly of worldly things and not in doing so become implicated with Satan? Still, more to the point, since nothing can be done today without paying for it, how is it possible for us to take money, that thing which is a supreme factor in building up the kingdom of Antichrist, and use it to build up the kingdom of Christ? The widow who dropped her might into the temple treasury did something so acceptable to the Lord that she received from him special commendation. 
What in fact she did was just this. She took something out of the kingdom of Satan and contributed it to the kingdom of God. And Jesus approved. So how, let us ask ourselves, is such a transfer made? How is it possible to take money, which in its character is essentially unrighteous, and with it build up the kingdom of God? How can you make sure that all connection between the world and the money in your pocket has been severed? Do you dare to say that none of the money in your possession figures in Satan's books? On every Roman denarius, there was an image of Caesar. In Jesus' words, all such coins are Caesar's. How could the connection between Caesar and that coin be severed? Money is a thing of the world. It is an essential part of the world system. How then can it be taken out of the world that claims it and be devoted to God for his use? In Old Testament times, a rigid principle was laid down. No devoted thing that a man shall devote unto the Lord of all that he hath, whether of man or beast, or of the field of his possession, shall be sold or redeemed. Every devoted thing is most holy unto the Lord. You'll find this in Leviticus 27 verse 28. In other words, there is no true devotion without destruction. If in those days a sheep was devoted to God, it was not placed before him to remain there as a living sheep and to bring forth lambs. It was placed before him to be sacrificed. It, we are told, shall certainly be put to death. Again, Leviticus 27, this time verse 29. Its destruction was the sign of its acceptance. All money that is truly devoted to God must come under the principle of destruction. That is to say, it must cease to exist as far as the world is concerned, and it must cease to exist also as far as we are concerned. When our Lord commended the widow for putting her two coins into the treasury, he observed that she had put in her bios, that is, her life. We're told in Mark 12, 44, she of her want did cast in all that she had, even all her living. Many people just put money into the treasury of the Lord. She put her life in with her money. In other words, when that money went out of her possession, her life went out with it. In giving her two coins, she literally gave her all. If your money is to come out of the world, then your life will have to come out of the world as well. You cannot keep yourself back and contribute anything significant to God. You cannot send your money out of the world at all. You can only bring it out of the world. Thus, it is no easy matter to transfer money from the realm of Satan to the realm of God. It involves travail. To convert souls from Satan to God is, in fact, easier than to convert money from Satan to God. By the grace of God, men and women may be won to him, whether or not we ourselves are devoted in any utter sense. But this is not so with money. It takes great spiritual power to convert our shekels, which in their character are evil, into shekels of the sanctuary. Money needs converting as truly as men need converting. And the money can, I believe, be made anew, if in a rather different sense, as truly as souls can be made anew. But your bringing of an offering of money to the treasury will not in itself change the character of the money you offer. Unless your life goes out with your money, it cannot be released from the kingdom of Satan and transferred to the kingdom of God. The spiritual value of your work for God will largely depend on whether or not the money you handle has been delivered from the world system. I ask you, has it? Can you claim that there is no money in your hand that belongs to this world? Are you able to say now 
that your money is no longer a part of the cosmos, for it has all been converted. Are you willing to tell God, I will convert all the money I earn by labor and all the money I receive by gifts, that it may all be thine? To Paul, the principle was very plain. We want you, not yours. Of the Macedonian saints who out of their poverty contributed so liberally, Paul said that first they gave their own selves to the Lord. Then they gave of their money, 2 Corinthians chapter 8, verse 5. Paul had his training in the Old Testament, where the consecration of material gifts was always connected with the consecrations of those who brought the gifts. His reasoning may have had its roots there. It may sound startling, but it is true that God has a limited supply of money whereas Satan's supply is unlimited. You wonder perhaps how this statement can be reconciled with that other one, that all the silver and gold are his. Yet our Lord Jesus himself says that there is that which belongs to God and that which belongs to Caesar. Ultimately, no doubt, all material things belong to God as creator. But the amount of money in God's treasury today is limited by the number of people who are devoted to him. If you or I had lived in Old Testament times, we could have calculated immediately the amount of money in the sanctuary. We would have inquired the total number of the children of Israel and reckoned half a shekel of silver for the redemption of each of them. We are told this in Exodus chapter 30, verses 11 through 16. To that, we would have added five shekels per head for the redemption of each of the firstborn of Israel in excess of the Levites, Numbers 3, 39 through 51. And then to these two amounts, we would have added the valuation according to the shekel of the sanctuary put upon each individual of who his free will devoted himself to the Lord. Leviticus 27, 1 through 8. Yes, it is the number of God's people that determine the amount of God's money. The margin of wealth in God's treasury is based on the number of people devoted to him. Here then is a vital question for each one of us to answer. Does the money that we are touching today represent shekels of the sanctuary or the mammon of unrighteousness? Whenever I receive a dollar, or whenever I earn a dollar, let me make sure that that dollar is instantly converted from world currency into the currency of the sanctuary. Money can be our destruction, friends, but money can also be our protection. Do not despise money. Its value is too real for that. It can be of great account to the Lord. If you yourself come heart and soul out of the world, then you can, if God so wills it, bring many precious things out of the world with you. When the Israelites came out of Egypt, they brought away much treasure with them. They plundered the Egyptians, we are told, and the spoil they carried away with them was to construct the tabernacle. Some too, we recall, went to construct a golden calf and were lost to God. But when God's people left Egypt, the tabernacle, at least in its materials, left Egypt with them. Egyptian gold, silver, copper, linen, all was converted and contributed to the sanctuary of God. If you can find that reality in Old Testament times, how much higher still must be the standard set in the New Testament when we are told many times over to hold nothing to ourselves? For instance, in Luke 6:38, give and it shall be given unto you. Those were our Lord's words. He did not say save and ye shall grow rich. He said give and it shall be given unto you. That is to say the principle of divine increase is giving, not storage. God requires of every one of us proportionate and not just random giving. 
He desires, that is to say, giving that is not subject merely to the whim of the moment, but that is the fruit of a definite covenant reached with him about the matter, and then stuck to. This is because the real secret of spoiling Satan is, as we saw, personal dedication. For us to be redeemed from the world and not as a consequence offer ourselves to God is an utterly impossible thing. We're told in 1 Corinthians chapter 6, verses 19 and 20, you are not your own. You have been bought with a price. It matters not whether we follow a profession or trade that brings us an income from the world. It doesn't matter if we occupy ourselves solely in preaching the word and depend for our substance upon the gifts of God's people. There is only one road before us, not two. We are all equally dedicated to God, and we are all his witnesses in this earth, in this cosmos. It is simply not true that preaching the gospel in itself is clean and business unclean, so that those who engage in the latter must become so tainted as to be of less account to God. What matters is simply that God, and not our business, must be the center of our lives. In 1 John chapter 2, verse 15, John tells us, Love not the world, neither the things that are in the world. You have an anointing from the Holy One. Live by it. Give yourself to God. Live for Him wholly and utterly. See to it that where you personally are concerned, the things of this world are scored off Satan's books, and they are transferred to God's account. For the world passes away, and the lusts of the world, they too pass away. But he that does the will of God, hallelujah, shall abide forever. And that, dear friends, brings us to the end of Love Not the World. And I trust that you have been challenged in many ways, inspired in many ways to become a better follower of the Lord Jesus as you seek to live as a pilgrim in this world, a stranger in this world, not belonging to this society, not belonging to a nation, not belonging to a people, but belonging to the kingdom of God. That is where our inheritance lies. That is our great and blessed hope. Yet, because we are mere mortals, let us learn to live in this world, but not of this world. Well, I love you, friends. I'm so grateful again that you took a few moments out of your busy day and you spent some time in the Word of God, being reminded of what is important to Him and what we should be striving for as we follow the command of our Lord Jesus to be perfect as our Father in heaven is perfect. And if that was not achievable, friends, now think about this. If that was not achievable, Jesus would have never set it before us. But Jesus did set that before us. He commanded us, be ye perfect as your Father in heaven is perfect. It doesn't matter how you define perfect. It doesn't matter if you say be ye mature, be ye complete, or be ye perfect. What matters is it says, as your Father in heaven. So we want to live our life in this world, in this cosmos, as the Father himself would live in this world. And we see that through the life of Jesus. We see a life of sacrifice. We see a life of discipline. And we see a life of surrender. And that, friends, should be the greatest attributes of our lives as we seek to live faithfully before him each and every day, in every word, in every thought, and in every deed. Well, may the Lord Jesus, through the power of his Spirit, continue to bless you, teach you, and guide you as you walk day in and day out in your journey with him. And may your heart be full of joy, your mind rest in peace, and your soul sing the great praises that belong to our great God and King, the Lord Jesus Christ. 
Now, as he wills and until next time, friends, I truly love you. May the Lord Jesus keep you and bless you. And I'll see you on the next video.